My name is Sanjay Gupta, I'm a consultant cardiologist in York, and today's video is on the subject of AF and dementia. Now, the first thing I wanted to say is that unfortunately, the practice of modern day medicine is largely servile to clinical guidelines. We decide how to treat a patient based on how someone else, i.e. whoever wrote the guideline, tells us how to manage the patient. If we stick to the guideline, we feel that we are offering top quality care and we can defend ourselves in court. If we don't stick to the guideline, then we feel vulnerable to criticism by our own colleagues and also medico-legal lawyers. Much of the guidelines that are published by august bodies like NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, are based around an examination of the evidence base to see how beneficial an intervention may be, but also how cost-effective it may be. If it is not deemed beneficial or cost-effective, it is not recommended. And unfortunately, everyone then believes that it is not worth considering in the patient's management. The problem is that guidelines lag several years behind research. And therefore, when scientists find something important through observation, the first thing they have to do is conduct rigorous experiments to confirm or refute their suspicion. Then they have to con further confirm this by doing large-scale human trials. Then they have to find a journal to publish the data. And if the data are very persuasive, then a bunch of experts get together and decide whether the findings are worthy of changing guidance. And then that guidance is published, and it can take several years for that change in guidelines to be adopted as a change in medical practice at grassroots level. The whole process can therefore easily take 10 to 15 years and therefore patients may continue to be managed in a suboptimal manner for this duration of time, even when there is available research to say that things could be done better. As doctors are generally very defensive and not particularly reflective, it is important for patients to be aware of the latest research so that they can advocate for themselves and use any available new research in their decision-making process. This is the foundation of patient empowerment. This is why I started this channel. I believe that patients should be equipped with all the information that is out there to allow them to work out the best way they would like their condition to be managed. And that the doctor's role is that of being an educator and an, an, an enabler rather than the doctor acting as if they know everything and the patient knows nothing. Today, I wanted to talk about some troubling research in the field of AF. AF stands for atrial fibrillation. AF is one of the most common heart rhythm disturbances and can affect up to 2% of the population. The big risk of AF is thought to be an increased risk of strokes. And therefore, whenever we see patients above the age of 65, or patients who carry comorbidities, we recommend lifelong anticoagulation, and as long as the patient is anticoagulated, we feel that the patient is safe. We never really think beyond the risk of stroke. If the patient is younger than 65 and does not carry comorbidities, we don't anticoagulate them because we believe that the risk of stroke is very low. However, over the past few years, there have been several studies which have studied AF patients and discovered that patients with AF have a significantly higher prevalence of cognitive impairment and dementia. And as we do not have any clinical guidelines about this as yet, we have to try and work out for ourselves as to why there is this association. So the first thing is, could it just be coincidence? This is very unlikely. It is very unlikely that this is just a coincidence because there have been several large-scale studies that have confirmed this. There was a study in 2009, 2009, so that's almost uh, 12 years ago, called the Intermountain Heart Collaborative Study, which evaluated 37,000 patients and followed them up for development of AF and dementia and found that patients with AF were 44% more likely to develop dementia compared to patients without AF. In addition, younger patients, patients under the age of 70, this is important because these patients are traditionally considered to be at lower risk of strokes. Patients under the age of 70 
were at a higher risk of developing all forms of dementia, and particularly Alzheimer's dementia. And patients with AF and dementia had a significantly higher mortality compared to patients with dementia who did not have AF. So really worrying data. Another analysis of a couple of studies, the on-target and the transcend studies, showed that AF was associated with an increased risk of cognitive decline, new onset dementia, loss of independence in performing activities of daily living, and a higher admission rate to long-term care facilities. There was another study called the Rotterdam study, which again showed that dementia was commoner in AF patients, and in particular in younger patients with AF. All in all, there have been more than 14 studies which have looked at this association, and most have confirmed this finding. So it is highly likely that this is not just a coincidence, but there is a relationship between AF and the development of dementia. So we now need to work out what that relationship could be. Could it be because AF and dementia share the same risk factors rather than specifically because the AF is in some way causing the dementia? Well, AF and dementia affect older people and sicker people, especially those that have vascular risk factors such as diabetes, high blood pressure. And I'm sure that to an extent it is true that the increased risk of dementia is probably because of all the other things that also increase your risk of AF, like age, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, etc. And it is therefore crucial that when we manage patients with AF, we tackle additional risk factors. In some ways, just anticoagulating the patient does not make the patient healthier. We are just trying to reduce the stroke risk. However, educating the patient to improve their lifestyle and aggressively targeting their risk factors will make the patient a healthier person. And therefore, this should be encouraged in every AF patient. Unfortunately, this is not done. A person with AF comes, people just put them on anticoagulants, let them go home. But it is incredibly important to look to see, is the patient overweight? Is the patient, uh, has the patient got sleep apnea? Have they got uncontrolled blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. And targeting that is incredibly important. Now, the next question is, could AF by itself be causing the dementia to develop? We know that AF patients are more likely to have clot formation within the heart, and those clots can go to the brain and cause strokes. This is, and a stroke is, a, is the patient noticing a visible loss of neurological function. However, it is also very possible that there may be microclots being forming in the heart and being dislodged and going to the brain. And because these clots are so tiny, they don't cause an overt stroke, but they can cause tiny areas of brain death and therefore cause a progressive loss of brain function. It doesn't show up as a stroke, so no one says, oh, you've had a stroke, but progressively and slowly, brain function is depleted. This has indeed been confirmed, and there was a study called the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study, which did indeed confirm that cognitive de decline in patients with AF was observed in those who had subclinical cerebral infarcts. So there is evidence of small microstrokes in patients uh, with AF, uh, which, which could be contributing to the development of dementia. Another mechanism may be that when we are in AF, our hearts are not pumping out as much blood as they would if we were in a normal sinus rhythm. And therefore, could it be that that lack of blood may be contributing to loss of brain function? If indeed this was the case, then perhaps keeping the patient in sinus rhythm may result in less likelihood of dementia. Could it also perhaps be that the treatment of AF with anticoagulants could be contributing to the dementia, i.e. microbleeds because you're on an anticoagulant? Could this be another mechanism of progressive loss of brain function? Are there any studies out there that can help us work out which of these possible mechanisms is the most likely to explain the relationship between AF and dementia? I've already told you that there is some evidence that AF can, uh, patients can have microinfarcts without a proper stroke. If this were the case, then taking an anticoagulant could be protective. And there are some studies that have suggested that there is perhaps a small uh, difference favoring anticoagulation uh, in patients who have AF. Uh, and in some ways, there are studies which have uh, looked at patients who were taking warfarin, and they showed that if the warfarin control was very good, 
then you were at a lower risk of dementia compared to if your warfarin control was poor. There was also a Swedish retrospective study which looked at 444,000 patients and found that those patients who had AF but never had a stroke, never had had a stroke, who were also taking anticoagulants at baseline, had a 29% lower risk of de developing dementia compared to those patients who were not on anticoagulants. So it does seem that anticoagulation may be beneficial, and particularly in those patients in whom the anticoagulation was started early after the first diagnosis of AF, first diagnosed episode of AF. So it does appear that maybe early anticoagulation is protective, although the evidence is not very robust, and this is why we need clinical studies to look at this. Of course, there is the other possibility that when you're in AF, your heart is not pumping out as much blood, and maybe that could be contributing. So now we have AF ablations where you can get rid of the AF and try and get the heart back into a normal rhythm. So is there any evidence that if you have an ablation, then you are less likely to develop dementia. And in the Intermountain AF study, the researchers compared 4,212 consecutive patients who had undergone an ablation with, I think, 16,848 patients with AF who did not have an ablation and found that Alzheimer's dementia seemed to occur in 0.2% of the ablated patients compared to 0.9% compared to of the non-ablated patients. It also seemed that other forms of dementia were also significantly reduced in patients with AF who were treated by an ablation. So we definitely need better data and a study really to see whether rhythm control through an ablation can reduce the risk of future dementia. The problem is, a study like this will need thousands and thousands of patients and would be required to run for a very long time and therefore it is unlikely that such a study will be done. You have to try and work out, for a study to be done, someone has to make money, and it's difficult to try and work out where, A, the money will come from for something like this. So based on these data, the conclusions we can draw so far about AF and dementia are, one, AF is associated with strokes, but it is also associated with dementia, and all forms of dementia. Secondly, Modification of lifestyle and control of vascular risk factors is always essential in the management of AF. Thirdly, anticoagulation does not increase the risk of dementia, but may be protective and therefore should be started as soon as possible after the first episode of AF, especially in patients who by current guidelines are eligible for anticoagulation. Number four, Scanning of the brain, even in the absence of a stroke, may help detect microinfarcts, which may then allow you to work out if you are at a higher risk of dementia, even if you don't meet current eligibility criteria for anticoagulation. Meaning that if you are young and you don't have any risk factors, most doctors would not give you an anticoagulant. But if you're uncomfortable about this idea, having a brain scan and looking for evidence of microinfarcts may help uh, you make that decision as to whether anticoagulation is right for you, rather than just accepting conventional wisdom that you are low risk. We desperately need studies to tell us whether anticoagulation and rate control strategies such as, uh, sorry, rhythm control strategies such as an ablation reduce the risk of dementia. And if this is proven, then this may just completely change how we manage AF in the future. So I hope this is useful. Dementia is a very scary subject for anyone to have to confront with. And my intention is not to cause people to worry, but I do worry that it may be another 10 to 20 years before we have more data and clinical guidance starts changing. And for some patients, that may be 20 years too late. This is why I wanted my viewers to be aware of this troubling research and for you to keep yourselves abreast of what's going on in the AF and dementia world. I wish you all good help and lots of joy. Thank you so much. All the best.